Well, we are real privileged to, uh, to have the Donyers here. And as I just mentioned, they're doing a great work. And, and I know Pastor Hag and Sister Donna are very confident of, of the work that is being overseen by these two. And then the team that they have around them. You know, it isn't just one person or two people. No, there's a whole team as well. And uh, this is a, a real treat for us today to have the Donyers with us. So please stand to your feet, put your hands together, and welcome Pastor Melvane Donyers and his lovely wife, Lynette. Yes, well. Thank you so much. It's a great pleasure. You may be seated. Thank you. We uh, just had not planned to be here uh, this week. We got a hold of Pastor Tom yesterday morning, I think it was, and said, look, we would love to come and say hello and goodbye. And uh, he said, yeah, come on out. So we are privileged beyond words to be able to be made welcome. We thank you for always making us feel comfortable and welcomed in this place. We know it's not us. We know it's mom and dad and what they have uh, spent, the time they've spent, and they want to send their greetings. They are unable to travel much these days. Dad is actually in a recuperation center, a convalescent home right now, hoping to get strong enough in the next couple of weeks to come back home. Um, we're just waiting on the Lord to do, to turn it around, to turn it around, to turn it around. Amen. Uh, but this is my wife, Lynette. She has been by my side, uh, oftentimes kind of pushing me from the back, uh, but uh, sometimes holding me back as well, which is always a good thing. We've been together for 40, uh, excuse me, 30, 40 and a half years. So welcome, Lynette Donye. There you go. Uh, all right, I'm just going to be the narrator of these slides here. There's, that's us. We're not in heaven. We are um, on the top of Table Mountain in Cape Town. And that's a picture of my grandparents, Paul and Helen Haig, who started the mission. Uh, mom and dad, of course. My mom and dad, beloved of us. Uh, it is our hope and it is our privilege to be able, to, it's our honor and privilege to be able to carry on what mom and dad and my grandparents started almost 70 years ago. Um, this is a picture, sorry? For such a time as this. That's a picture of the National Executive Council. The guy right behind the podium is Pastor Stephen Frank. And he's been, we've known him since he was a teenager. So he's 70 now. So we've known him a long time. I was just a little kid when I met him. Next slide is fine. Thank you. This is what, uh, we have a program that we call Jesus in Real Life. And uh, we go around different parts of the country teaching this. It's made up of three different programs so far. We're hoping to add a whole bunch more. The first one is the Commands of Christ, which is a basic discipleship program that we want to teach the congregations that they can reach their friends and family and neighbors. Uh, then we have a boundaries and priorities, the things that we need to have in line, in the right order, to receive full blessings and success from God. And then the heartbeat of God. God's heartbeat is dual for the local church and also for the global church. And like I said, we plan to uh, add more courses, and we are opening up a train the trainers program where we, South Africa has 11 official languages, guys, okay? I know English, hopefully, I was an English teacher, I should. Um, I know Afrikaans, which is kind of a mixture of Dutch and other languages, and a teeny tiny bit of Zulu. I'm, I'm taking Duolingo, trying to learn Zulu. And I can't speak 11 languages, so our strategy is to train the trainers so they can train their people in their own language, in ways that they understand. You know, and even though I grew up in South Africa, I still have a Western point of view. And so I want them to be able to reach them in their own language with their own, within their own culture. Okay, next slide. And what is our strategy? Um, in the past, we have had them, the students, 12 students at a time, because that's all the space we had would come to the mission headquarters and we'd teach them for like two, three weeks and then send them back and then after a bit of time we'd have them back again. God gave us a new strategy this last time. It was to go to the areas, go to them. And over a weekend, like a Friday, Saturday and Sunday, we would have this workshop. And we were able to reach not just 12 people like in the past, but we were able to teach over 200 people this within a three and a half month span. So I 
this is a strategy God definitely gave us. We're thrilled about it. All right. And it also just connects the different areas because South Africa, is, they have some very isolated areas. And to be able to feel connected to the rest of the mission, to know there are others that are believing and reaching people just as they are. All right, next slide. Uh, these are the Jesus in Real Life workshops, just a few that we had. The first one was in an area called Lutlue. The second one, going clockwise, so the black and white is Lutlue. The second one is Gordon's Bay. Isn't that pretty? Yeah, you should come visit us sometime. We take you there. And then at the bottom is Hanover. Uh, we had over 75 people there at that particular uh, workshop. And about three months after we were there, they started a new plant, a new church in that, in that town. So uh, God is amazing. Next slide. And this is in a workshop in Zululand where God has just really opened it up to us. Um, you see that giraffe there on the hill? He's just on the side of the road, people. We're just driving from one town to the other, and that giraffe was just checking our cars. We drove by and kind of watched us. I don't know. And uh, that's um, in Slabisa, Pastor Mshali, and God really placed a burden on his heart to reach his town and to evangelize and disciple the people. So he had us do the discipling course there. And uh, not too long after that, they started a prayer walk with other same believing, similar believing churches to go around and pray for Christian businesses, to go and pray certain businesses out of town and to just pray for their pray for their city officials so they do that on a regular basis next slide and then we also were privileged to travel to mozambique which is a country that was always close to us as i was growing up it was a dangerous place they had mines in the roads uh, they didn't want you know they had a civil war going on in the past and they had mines that they put in the roads and so a lot of people did not want to travel there even after the Civil War had ended because they didn't know where the mines were. They have since cleared them up and we were able to go. And for, from left to right, I just gave you some of those pictures. The first two were pretty good condition. That third church we went to was just made up of a tent with holes, reeds, and a few cement blocks. I happened, I was struggling with my hips at that time and I kind of leaned back to kind of give a little bit of relief and oh, it moved. So I moved <laughs> far away. Those are all churches that um, they fellowship with ours. They belong to the same fellowship as the SAEM. And they are in various stages of building. All right, next slide. Another group that we are involved with is Emerging Leaders, which is made up of a lot of pastors' kids and other young adults that have grown up through the mission. And they go around to different areas to just hold rallies, and encourage young people to get involved in the work of God, to encourage young people that they need to reach their generation. And so we, we are, um, they're holding these, uh, these rallies, and they plan to go to different parts of the country as well. All right, next slide. So this, what's ahead? It looks like a lot, okay? So we have the TED Training, education, and development. The training is basically what we were doing with Jesus in real life. The actual o whole program is called Kingdom to Community Training. Then we have education, which is the CBI, Calvary Bible Institute, that my mom and dad started decades ago. I think I was 13 when I took one of the first courses. I remember my mom telling me that she went through it very carefully to make sure she didn't give me any easy grades and she, she was really, she was a very strict teacher. And then we have development, which is the emerging leaders. They, they develop the young people. We have lots of travel ahead of us. Uh, we also, like I mentioned before, want to have train the trainers and ministry in the churches. And we want to equip leaders as much as we can to be able to plant new works in different areas to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Next one. And this is just a cute... Christmas picture of Mal and Lynn with the Grand Duchesses. My daughter Kendra is the princess, and all my granddaughters are the Grand Duchesses. So that is Abigail, bottom left, Amira, and Eleonora. All right. I think that's it. Next slide. All right. That's it. Thank you.
Thank you. Yeah, we are excited to get back. We are leaving, God willing, next Monday. So not this, not tomorrow, but the week after. We'll be flying into Sydney and Hobart, Australia. We've never been. We are looking forward to ministering uh, in a couple of churches in the next two weeks in Australia. And then, God willing, we'll be catching a flight into Joburg. Uh, we are scheduled to do a Kingdom to, to Community training event with Jesus in real life in Johannesburg on the 2nd through the 4th of February. So pray for us. We've got lots of miles to cover between now and then, but we're believing God has uh, put us into place and given us these opportunities just at the right time. And so we are, we're grateful to be sent by you and your church. We were talking with the Hagues, and they said, you know, um, they have been such faithful supporters for decades your pastor, your, your father, Kim, and, and your mom, and, and your entire family has just been giving to our family. And so as we have connected our hearts these last few years, it's been such a privilege to get to know your pastor and Sister Kim and, and just the entire family. And we have walked with them from a distance through some of the challenges that they've faced and so if you'll allow me just a few moments to depart away, I do have a, a message. I want to make sure you know I did my homework. I prepared a message, but I believe God wants to speak to you prophetically. Is that okay? Do you trust me? Thank you. Father, I thank you for this precious couple. Lord, we believe that you have called them together. Lord, that you have knit their hearts as one. And Lord, even as those voices have been raised against them, Lord, you are raising up a standard against the enemy. And the attack of the enemy will not succeed. It will come. It will come, but it will not succeed. And so we thank you, Lord, that you have given them to each other. You have given them good and godly children. You've given them people who are in their corner who are on their side. And Father, I pray that those of us who are loyal will be continually loyal. Lord, those of us who have stood with them will continue to stand with them. Father, we pray that you would bless them and let this year be a year of blessing and peace as they've gone through hard times and hard seasons, Lord, and the tears have come and the heartbreak has been there to the point of almost no return, God. You have instead turned it around, turned it around, turned it around. And Lord, we thank you that you continue to give life where there seems to be an opportunity for death to enter in and curses to come and to be manifold and to be manifest. Lord, instead you break those curses and Lord, you bring resurrection life into this couple. And Lord, the ministry gifts that you have placed on them. There have been men who have stood behind this pulpit and have seen it as a place to find prestige and power and position. And they have stood looking for what they can get out of it. But God says, I see in you, my son, a different spirit. I see in you not a desire for power, prestige or position, but you have a passion for people. And as I have placed in you a love for people, says God, that is going to be the determining factor in every accusation that is raised against you. So to continue to operate from a heart of love, continue to operate from an opposite spirit, Continue to love my people, says the Lord, and you will continue to be blessed and flourish in this vineyard that I have planted you, my daughter, my precious one. As you have gone through the dark night of the soul, I have been with you, and you have stood by looking and asking and questioning, and yet I have always been with you. I have never left you. I've never forsaken you, and I never will. I've given you gifts and abilities beyond those of most people, and I would desire that you continue to use those gifts and continue to invest in generations to come so that many can praise and can rejoice in my presence in the ways that you have taught them. Lord, the passion that you have to teach, 
the passion that you have to tutor, the passion that you have to mentor will continue to grow. And Lord, that you will continue to give them opportunities in this community to be favored in this community, Lord. Father, we pray that there would be those that would rise up and call themselves blessed of the Lord because of the ministry of Kim and Tom and their family. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for the days to come. Lord, as they continue to serve you, as they continue to look for opportunities, Lord, that they would continue to believe beyond that which looks like is going on. And Lord, that they would continue to put their faith in their confidence, not in themselves, not in their great abilities, which are pretty impressive. Lord, we recognize the excellence that they operate in, and we rejoice. But Lord, it's not that that will sustain them. It is your hand developed inside of them, working out, manifesting that which you have grown in them for decades, Lord. Father, I pray that this couple and their family, Lord, would be joined together to rejoice in all that you do. And they will look back and say, look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. We thank you again, Pastor, for the opportunity to come. We know that uh, last-minute things are sometimes challenging. So we thank you for allowing us to come. I do want to share a, a little bit here, and I want to be also mindful of the time because he said I have six hours, but I know he was lying. Um, I know that would be uh, extending the friendship way too far. And by the way, he did say that he's taking me out for lunch, so I guarantee you will. It would not be a six-hour message. Four questions for 2004. You ready? Are you done yet? Are you done yet? Are these the last days? Are you going to make it? Question number three, are you going to make it? Question number four, are you living your dream? Father, we thank you for this time. We rejoice in the generosity of your people, their willingness to come, Lord, to hear, to open up their pulpit. Lord, we thank you. We're not deserving of ourselves, and yet, Lord, we carry the gift of your Holy Spirit within us. Lord, as we share your word this morning, may it be received with gladness. May we be touched. May our ears hear. May our spirits receive that which you want to share with us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Happy New Year. Anyone feel like it just Thanksgiving was yesterday? <laughs> Christmas was last night, and here it is already New Year's. It's just blown right past. I was reflecting back as we went into the new year about the time that about la last year, about this time, I was recovering from a, a, a medical emergency. My brain kind of reset, and uh, I had gone in, and I, I started at home just not being able to articulate, not being able to form words. The words that I formed didn't match up to what I was looking for, and some of you in this room know what that means. You're basically having a stroke, or a TMI is what they called it, and they, uh, sorry, that's too much information. Sorry, what's TIA, that's it, that's it. Um, TIA, I'll tell you about the TMI here in just a minute. But uh, the, I, I lost the ability to really articulate. If you ever long for attention, go into a hospital and say you think you're experiencing a stroke. I mean, there's about 25 people that come cascading upon you. And I went through that, and as I walked through that experience in the hospital, I began to realize a couple of things. Just, just off the top of my head, I want to share just a couple of thoughts as I was sitting in the, the hospital recuperating. Uh, hospital gowns. This is, <laughs> this is the TMI portion. Hospital gowns. I finally might understand the appeal of nightshirts. Surprisingly, they are comfortable. A nice fabric, so breathable, right? Unless you have to walk in one and realize there's nothing covering your back. That's the TMI. Hospital food. It's not bad, but it is flavorless, and you have to order the flavor separately. And if you think you're getting vegetables with your pot roast, think again. 
you got to order the salt and the garlic as well. Hospital care, it's not about your convenience. It's about their schedule. Is that right? You've experienced that? The 5 a.m. phlebotomist named Robin is not interested in hearing how it would be much more convenient for you to come back after 8. One of the most heartbreaking parts of my stay, though, in the hospital was overhearing a a conversation with a woman who was quite old, probably in her 80s or maybe even beyond, and she was unable to communicate, and the doctor was telling the family, you know, she's not able to communicate, but we do have a DNR order, a do not resuscitate, so we'll work on her. On your behalf, we'll deal with the infection, we'll make her comfortable, but if she slips into needing resuscitation, we won't do that. And it got me to thinking, I wonder if that's maybe where some of us are. Are we going to be able, Will, to share that little video clip? Is that possible? Is that going to play? Can you back it up one? A little video clip. This is the the lovely lady, uh, Nico and Joanne Smith from Hobart, Australia. These are the folks that we're going to go see. If you can click on that, oh, you're not going to be able to. Well, basically, Joanne is sharing an image that she had, a vision that she had, that many Christians' lives have a DNR order. Do not resuscitate. Do not perform CPR. We are fine where we are. We are happy to be in the place that we're at. I want you to know and understand that God will allow you to come to a place in your ministry where you can be at rest. I am not though among those who say that Christians can never retire. I'm not among those who say that you can never have a joy, joyful life and you can never spend time with your kids or your grandkids. I think God will allow you to do any of those things. I reckon he is an of course God. Can I explain that? God is an of course God. When you come to him and you say, Lord, may I do this? It's of course you may do this. Enter, enjoy, of course you can. But I also believe that God has a higher calling and a higher purpose for many of his people. And he wants us to press in for that which he has grabbed a hold of us. And he doesn't want to leave us with a DNR, a do not resuscitate order. In fact, he wants us to experience CPR. He wants to breathe new life into these tired old lungs. He wants to bring this heart back to life again. This heart that has been broken and shred, torn apart, filled with despair because the words, the careless words of people who don't have our best interest at heart. Kim, I tell you the truth. If people knew you like God knows you, they would love you like he does. But because they don't know you like God loves you, not like God knows you, they can't love you. Our hearts are broken. And we can have a choice to do not resuscitate. Just let us slip away. Or, God, come. God, come breathe new life. God, come breathe your breath. Give us life once again. Let's go on, Will. Thank you so much. He wants to have a living relationship with us. He doesn't want us to be found in despair, in despondency, in a place where we are caught in between the shadow of death. He wants us to pursue life and life more abundant. He wants us to be filled with confidence for the future. How about this? How many survived COVID? If you're here, I assume you survived. Yeah, Probably most of you had it, maybe a couple times, right? I don't know why you're here. When so many people aren't. I know this church did what our church did. They fasted and prayed when they heard that Pastor Tyron, the moderator of SAEM, had COVID. They believed for God to heal him. Your your prayers, and not just your prayers, but your giving went forward as a sweet-smelling savor to God, asking that Tyron's life be spared, but it wasn't. He died, and we did not. 
You did not. You survived. Why are you here? I believe that is the question. That is the purpose that God wants to reveal to each one of us in these days to come. That's why he's given us a new year, 2024, to forget the old years and to press into the newness of life that God has for us. It is a new year, and it is an opportunity for us to understand and to explore why we are on the planet when so many people aren't, when so many people were taken home. I, I was speaking with a pastor in Gordon's Bay. Lynette shared a picture. And in his circle, in his fellowship, there were 56 funerals from COVID. Now, he doesn't have a big church, understand. But in his community and in his church, there were 56 funerals he performed. Why did so many people die? And why are we left? I wish I knew all the answers, but I do know this. I got a pulse, so I got a purpose. I apologize to the English teachers in the class. I got a pulse, so I got a purpose. That's me. I've got a pulse. I've got a purpose. It's my job. It's my passion. It is my uh, calling in 2024 to find out what my purpose is. So many people are still stuck in COVID. They are still wearing the mask. Now, maybe not literally, but they are still masking up. They're still hiding themselves. And when they're feeling a little sniffle, they are quick to disengage. And again, I'm not saying you shouldn't take the uh, health of your fellow man seriously. But what I'm saying is we are looking for excuses not to have to go back to the office. We're looking for ex excuses not to have to go to church or ha have to go to go out. We are so comfortable. COVID made us so comfortable. We're stuck, and God is saying, come out. Come, find out what you're here for. David said this, the king, First Chronicles 29, 14, who am I, and who are my people that we would give anything to you? We could give anything to you. Everything we have has come from you, and we give you only what you first gave us. We are here for only a moment, visitors and strangers in the land as our ancestors were before us. Our days on earth are like a passing shadow, gone too soon without a trace. That is the way things are on this earth. Life is fleeting. Time is going by so quickly. So my question for you is, are you done yet? Are you done yet? Maybe you're done Maybe you don't want to press in. Maybe you don't want to continue on. Maybe the time of, of your being the leader, maybe your time of being the one that people look to, maybe it has come to an end. And as long as you have God's approval on that, I'd say that's fine. I'm working with my father-in-law and my mother-in-law, whom you love and we love. They have come to the place where they are saying, we're done. We love you. But we're done. We love you. But we're not going to Bethel with you tomorrow. I wanted them to come. It's not, a, a, it's not a rebuke on them that they said, you know, we're just tired. We can't do that. They've traveled thousands. I mean, I'm not exaggerating to say hundreds of thousands of miles they've traveled. They're done. And that's okay. But for the rest of us, we can't all get to that place. Listen, I haven't earned the right to be done. I haven't driven the miles he's driven. I haven't been in the places that he's gone to. Listen, if I drove up with David Haig at any time to any church in Zululand, South Africa, you would hear the screaming and the ululations and the praises being raised to God's heaven from miles away. I mean, he is a, a rock star in South Africa, okay? The man deserves his rest. But God has not called me to rest. In fact, he stirs me up at night. I can barely sleep. I'm so filled with dreams and vision and passion because the mantle has been passed. The baton has been passed. And I cannot ignore the calling to see a blood-washed Africa. I cannot ignore the calling to see people set free from ancestral worship and to be freed from fear and bondage and set at liberty by those who 
need to speak by those of us who cannot just sit back and enjoy a comfortable life in River Falls, Wisconsin with their granddaughters and their sons and their daughters but are compelled to go out into the mission field. Are you done yet? Psalm 90 verse 12 says, teach us to realize the brevity of life. Some versions say, teach us to number our days so that we grow in wisdom. We want to number our days. Let us grow in wisdom. Let's go on, Will. Thank you so much, Will. You are a good and godly man whose God, God's calling is all over you. And you walk in his plan and his purposes. And general bless, generational blessing, I believe, is so much greater than generational curses. Listen, if you, I think we can all agree that you see alcoholism go through families. We see all sorts of generational curses, child abuse, poverty. It goes through families and histories and generations. I believe much more powerful than that are generational blessings. And Will, and your dear wife, Victoria, did I get that right? Yeah, sometimes the memory comes and goes. You walk in a generational blessing. Generations of people have walked, and you will receive the blessing as you continue to be found faithful. Will, thank you so much back there. Question number two, are, you, are these the last days? Are these the last days? It's become one of my most favorite questions to ask. Are these the last days? Let me ask you, are these the last days? You can say yes or no. Are these the last days? Just so you know, I'm setting you up. Are these the last days? I thought you'd say yes. Most of you have. Can I ask you to do something? If you believe these are the last days, would you start acting like it? Is that obnoxious enough for you? See, my father-in-law is the apostle of love. I'm the apostle of annoying. <laughs> I'm not an apostle. If you believe these are the last days, and I agree with you, we need to start acting like it. If these are the last days, we need to reevaluate our priorities, begin to think about how we spend our time and our money. And listen, I'm no saint. I, I'll just be honest with you. I am as prone to binge watch something on Netflix as probably you are. I will waste time. I'm not presenting myself as the be-all and end-all, but I will say this. Because I believe these are the last days and because I believe I am on a direct commandment to continue the legacy that the Hagues have laid in South Africa, I have been willing to reprioritize life. We sold our house. We are believing God to open up new vistas and new opportunities, perhaps in Zululand, so we can be closer to the people that we feel God has called us to. However it works out, I am changing my life to live up to the expectation that these are the last days. It doesn't mean, by the way, that God consults with me on when he's coming back. That's above my pay grade. We could have another five, another 10, another 500 years. It's not dependent on me. He's not going to ask my permission. When the final person has heard the good news, he can come. It may take a number of decades. I don't know. I do know this. For me, at 60 years of age, these are the last days. <laughs> I am not a young man anymore. Uh, it's been a long time. People used to tell me, Tom, maybe you can relate to this because I believe you are a wise man. People used to say, you are wise beyond your years. No one tells me that anymore. They expect me to be wise. In fact, sometimes they say, you're pretty stupid for a 60-year-old. You're doing what? You're selling what? You're moving where? Do you know they can't even keep the power on in that country? Hey, if these are the last days, please start acting like it. Okay? Fair enough? Okay. Let's go on. Well, we're... we're uh, we got time. 
We've got time to watch here. It's getting away from us. Question number three. Are you going to make it? Are you going to make it? What's that? You're going to make it after all. Everyone over 55 is already singing the little Mary Tyler Moore theme in your head, right? Going to make it after all. Are you going to make it? It's a fair question. Are you going to persevere beyond that which you find yourself in now? The truth is, life is hard. Things are difficult. The challenges that we see before us in our culture, in our nation, all of these things make us question what in the world is going on. I want to know, are you going to make it? I believe that one of the most powerful gifts God has given us as human beings is the freedom of choice. We can choose whether we are going to make it. We see over and over in Scripture that man, made in God's image, has a choice. It's a powerful one. Every day you and I get to decide whether we are going to bow to these temple walls or to the spirit that is locked inside. As you are spending 21 days in 2024... You get to get up every morning and say, Lord, how do you want me to fast? Because it's not about some religious observance or dietary restriction. I love what your pastor said. If you're spending more time focusing on whether the Daniel fast allows quinoa or not than you are on spending time with Jesus, you kind of missed the point. Have I bugged you yet? The spirit of annoying is upon me, I can tell you. Listen, it's not about fasting for diet. It's about coming into alignment and being willing to hear from him about what he is saying you are to fast that day or that hour or that moment. And then being found faithful to be obedient to do that and remain faithful for the time that he has called you to do it. Are you going to make it? Are you going to make it? He has given you a freedom of choice. You can choose to make it or you can choose to stay right where you are and not grow one inch, not grow one bit. That's the choice that you have for before you. It's a choice. It's confirmed by three powerful words. Ready? Yes, I will. Let's look at that next thing. Living with a yes, I do mentality, yes, I will mentality takes commitment. Paul says in Philippians, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Remember, it's a choice, and it's at least a daily one. For some of us, it's a moment-by-moment, hour-by-hour choice. However long it takes, at whatever price we pay, we can say with Paul, I can do all these things through Christ who gives me strength. Yes, I will. It takes a commitment. Look at the next slide. Yes, I will. Developing a yes, I will mentality. Are you going to make it? If so, you must develop this yes, I will mentality. Because winners never quit, right? That's what they say, and that is the truth. Winners never quit. 2 Timothy 4, 7. Again, Paul talking to his spiritual son. He says, I've fought the good fight. I've finished the course. I've kept the faith. He didn't say like we might say today in our mamby-pamby, theological, grace-driven, everything is allowed, everything is cool. I fought the fight when it was easy and it could be worked into my already busy schedule. I didn't have quite the drive and enthusiasm to finish the course because I found myself bored and there were so many other things to occupy my time. However, one of these days I will get back into it. Just you wait and see. No, Paul says, no, I I fought the course. I finished the race. I fought the good fight. And now, now I'm going to take hold of a crown that has been laid up for me. I believe your pastor, Pastor Paul's founding pastor, has reached his crown, has received his crown. My father-in-law, David Haig, is probably pretty close to receiving his crown. He's fought a good fight. He's finished the race, finished his course. I want to be found faithful. I don't know, I don't understand all about the great heavenly host. I don't understand the great cloud of witnesses, but I believe that if they're there, I want to give them a good show. I wanted to say, can you believe that guy just did that? That guy just survived that? 
That woman just to survive that onslaught of the enemy. Those curses did not light because they were curses without a cause. Yes, I will. Because ne quitters never win. And yes, I will. Go on, Will. You were right where you needed to be. It was me who was behind. Because quitters never win and winners never lose. Is that what that one says? Something like that. Galatians 6, let us not become weary. Ever become weary? Let us not become weary in will doing. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. If we do not give up. If we don't give up, we're going to reap a harvest. But you've got to not give up. Because quitters never win. 1 Corinthians 58 Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move me. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Quitters never win. There's always an excuse why they didn't quite get there. I don't want to leave excuses. I want to leave a good show. I want to give people what they paid for, and well beyond. I want to perform well beyond any expectation. Developing the yes, I will mentality, perseverance pays. Hebrews 10, verses 36 through 39. You need to persevere so that when you've done the will of God, you will receive what He has promised. For in just a little while, He who is coming will come and will not delay. But anyone who shrinks back, I take no pleasure. I, I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. But we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. Are you going to make it? Will you persevere? Will you finish the course? Yes, I will. Say it with me. Yes, I will. I will finish. Question number four. Let's get to it. Can I go just a little bit long? I tried to get done at 11.30. I'm, I didn't quite make it. Question number four, are you living your dream? <laughs> this is vital. Are you living your dream? Or are you just living your life? The older I become, the more I dream. I used to see visions, but now I dream dreams. And you know why. You've already gotten to the punchline if you know the scriptures. It's because I'm old. Peter says on the day of Pentecost, he quoted the prophet Joel who said, In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. I'm dreaming dreams these days. I believe God has called his children and especially his leaders to live a dream life. I understand I'm not talking about some pink, plastic, barbified dream life. I'm talking about a life that transcends normal day-to-day -day drudgeries and turns those things into mere, mere, inconsequential things, things to be pushed aside so that you can pursue the dream that God has set before you. Lynette and I have a dream that I can't even talk about without crying, without feeling the emotions, without feeling the Holy Spirit saying, yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's it. That's what I want you to go for. I can't talk to Tom and Kim about my dream because there's something in the dream that is beyond that which is natural. I cannot believe it, to be honest. I believe that if you can believe your dreams, they're probably not big enough. <laughs> if you could see yourselves doing your dream and fulfilling your dream, you might want to believe God for a bigger dream. Is that fair to say? Is that greedy? I hope not, because that's where I am. God has given us such a dream, such a vision, such a hope, he has destined you for such a lifelong dream that it captures your imagination. You will spend anything to make it happen. Remember Jesus talking about 
the pearl of great price, the woman who, the man who found the, the pearl, or, or the man who found the field, right? And he went and he sold everything that he had so he could buy that field because in it there was a hidden treasure. South Africa for us has become a hidden treasure. It's become a hidden treasure. I want you to share my dream. My wife invited you. <laughs> I don't think she was being flippant about it. I believe God is going to give us sufficient resources that if you all wanted to come, we'd find a place for you to sleep. And I'd cook you up something delicious, I promise. Dream a big dream. Are you living your dream? Stephen, the first martyr, Acts 7, we're not going to take the time to read it, but I want to remind you that he talks about some dreamers. He talks about Abraham, who was shown a vision of the sea and the stars in the sky, given a covenant of blood and sacrifice. I won't take the time this morning to get into it. But I will say this, dreams and visions are God's gift. They're not ours. We need to obey. That's all we have to do. What does God's word say? Abraham obeyed and it was accounted unto him as righteousness. Just because he obeyed. Because he believed God enough to be obedient to God, God accounted him righteous. If you want to be righteous, believe and obey. Dream a dream and go and pursue it. Joseph is a famous dreamer, also mentioned by Stephen, who dreamed that his brothers and his mom and dad would bow before him. He wasn't wrong. He was just premature and unwise to share the dream. I want you to know and understand, you've got to be careful where and when you share your dream. Don't share them prematurely and don't share them with just anyone. There are certain people who will listen to your dream and then throw you in a pit to make sure that that dream isn't fulfilled. Nebuchadnezzar dreamed. His dreams were interpreted. Remember, you're not God. And the dream you dream is not about you. you. Remember, he dreamed a dream and saw himself as grand and grandiose, and he was puffed up. God humbled him by making him like a cow, feeding him in a field. So it's not about you. It's about God. Number four, as we close, I want to remind you about Moses. The man whom God chose to lead the Israelites out of slavery. Remember how he was showed how he was not truly a son of Pharaoh, but rather was a Hebrew. His first plan of action was to get involved in a dispute between two Hebrews. You remember the story? Pick it up in Acts chapter 7. Again, we won't take the time to read it. Let me get to the, the key verse, though, is that verse 25, Acts 7, 25. Moses thought that his own people would realize that God was using him to rescue them, but they did not. Let me tell you something this morning. Folks will not understand your dream. <laughs> Get used to it. Set your expectations accordingly. People will say, what are you doing? You're 60 years old. What are you doing? You're selling everything and you're going to South Africa? They don't understand my dream, and that's okay. That's all right. They don't need to. I want them to partner. I want them to come along. I don't want them to think I'm crazy, but I want them, I, I know that they're not going to necessarily be able to do that. They, and that's okay. They are called to live a different dream. Don't expect that people are going to understand your dream. If you're going to dream dreams that are big enough for God to do great things through your life, understand that other folks are not going to get it. And don't go meddling in other folks' hassles. You don't have the time. Don't try to bring peace between two feuding Hebrews thinking that people are going to understand. They're not going to understand. You're going to be called to a different place. I might be preaching to myself right now. Forgive me. Let's go to the next one. In summary, oh, that's a, that's a hard slide to see. I'm sorry. In summary, are you done yet? It's a fair question. So manage your life. Number two, 
Are these the last days? If so, manage your time. Number three, are you going to make it? If so, manage your health. I didn't get into that a lot, but I want to make sure that you know that you've given, been given one body. And it's important. I didn't really take good care of my body. But it's important that you take care of yourself and do that which is necessary to extend life so that you can fulfill all that God has for you. And then four, are you living your dreams? If so, manage your expectations. Are you with me this morning? I promise we're closing right now. Are you ready? Would you stand up? Jesus, we thank you. Stand up with me. I'm going to pray a prayer over you. Father, we thank you for this new year. Father, we thank you that you've given to us all that pertains to life and godliness. You've given us all we need to do that which we have been called and purposed by you to do before the foundations of the earth. And we are honored to be called your sons and your daughters. Father, I pray your blessing upon every person in this room. Lord, may each one of us live long enough to fulfill our purpose here on earth. God, even after we are gone, we pray that our lives would speak of better things, of hope that we had, the confidence that we had in you. Lord, we know that there's something that's going to take every one of us home to meet you. And Lord, we don't look uh, away at that. We look that right in the face and we say, whatever it is, God will always be with me. He will never forsake me. We thank you, God, that because of what we've experienced in the past, we can have great confidence for you in the future. In 2024, may whatever it may hold, Lord, we ask that you would be glorified through our lives. Everything we say, everything we think, everything we do, every person whose lives we touch, God, may we be a catalyst for positive change. And all God's people said... Amen. Thank you so much for your close attention. God bless you. Glad for divine interruptions. <laughs> you know, I, I, I had things, every, I, everything was set and ready to rock and roll, but uh, I know that when God says, mm, time out, I want to do something a little different, then, then we just roll with it. So thank you, Pastor Melvane, for, for God's word. So Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your divine plan that you have for each one of us. And in this new year, Lord, and again, not just to harp on this, this new year concept, but you have new opportunities that are fresh for us. And we want, to, we want to be hard after your will, your plan, your purposes for our lives, so that when we're done with life, you can say, well done. We, we cannot receive a well done if we have not done a work well. And so, Holy Spirit, help us to be hard after what you want us to do, to be who you want us to be. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Well, God bless you today. We love you. We love you. We love you. We do. Uh, Pastor Kim won't be in the greeting line today. Again, we're just, we're just trying to navigate through all of this. And uh, But I will be. Uh, I know it's not as good as Pastor Kim, but I will be. And we love to greet you at the door. Your giving receipts are there, so please pick those up as well. And make sure you thank the Daniers for coming here today. God bless you.